ವರ್ಣಿವೇಶರಮಣೀಯದರ್ಶನ ಮಂದಹಾಸುಚಿರಾನಂಬುಜ ಪೂಜಿ ಸುರನರೋತ್ತಮೈರ್ಮುದ ಧರ್ಮನಂದನಮಹಂ ವಿಚಿಂತ ಧರ್ಮನಂದನಮಹಂ ವಿಚಿಂತ ಶ್ರೀ ಘನಶ್ಯಾಮ್ ಮಹಾರಾಜನೀ ಜಯ ಆಲ್ ಮೈಟಿ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಲಾರ್ಡ್ ಔರ್ ಬಿಲೌಡ್ ಘನಶ್ಯಾಮ್ ಮಹಾರಾಜ್ ಪಾತ್ ಮೇ ಕಟೋಲ್ ಬ್ರೈಸನ್ ಔರ್ ಪೂಜ್ಯ ಗುರುಜಿ ಪೂಜ್ಯ ಪೂಜಿ ಜನ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಡ್ಯೂಟೀಸ್ ಜೈ ಸ್ವಾಮಿನಾರಾಯಣ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಸಂಡೇ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸಿಂಗ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಭಕ್ತ ಚಿಂತಾಮಣಿ ಇಸ್ ಒನ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಪೋರ್ಸನ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಕಂಟೈನ್ ಪರ್ಚ ಪ್ರಕರಣ ನಾವು today 136 chapter in this chapter sadguru niskuran swami describe one of the incident happen in life of a devotee this is a different kind of incident which we have discussed before and describing this incident niskuran swami began vadi kahu ek varta ಶೂನೋತೆ ಸರ್ವೆ ಜನ ಬಿಡ ಪಡೆ ಜ್ಯಾರೆ ಭಕ್ತನೆ ತ್ಯಾರೆ ಭಯ ಹರೆ ಭಗವಾನ ಸದ್ಗುರು ನಿಸ್ಕುಡಾನಂದ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ರೈಟ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಟ್ಯಾಂಜ ದಟ್ ವೆನ್ ಯುವರ್ ಅ ಡ್ಯೂಟಿ ಆಫ್ ಘಾಡ್ ಎನ್ಕೌಂಟರ್ ಎನಿ ಕೈಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೀಸ್ರಿ ಎಟ್ ದ ಟೈಮ್ ವೆನ್ ಹಿ ಪ್ರೇ ಟು ಘಾಡ್ ಆರ್ ಇವನ್ ನಾಟ್ ಪ್ರೇಯಿಂಗ್ ಬಟ್ if a devotee remembered god and bhagwan swami narayan himself by, by any how protect his devotee this is a universal truth or this is a reality of our swami narayan sampraday not only in history but even today whoever devotee got any kind of misery or hardship in a life at that time if he remembers bhagwan or if he prayed to bhagwan bhagwan definitely help him and protect him from any kind of danger and passes his time easily which in which he can if bhagwan not protected him not help him then he definitely experience a great misery but bhagwan swami narayan is a lord of lords and supreme god and that is why he always ready to give any kind of help to his, to his devotees now today in this 136 chapter niskuran swami describe a incident in happen in life of jivram bhakt of vakaner Vakaner was a town in Gujarat. This Jivram Bhakta was living there happily. He was a businessman but still not spent all over his time in, uh, for business or jobs. But instead of spending more time in business, he spared much more time in devotion. He always chanting Bhagavan Swaminarayan's holy name, meaning Swaminarayan Mahamantra. and he always <coughs> try to engage his self into remembering divine incident and glory and greatness of bhagwan swami narayan not only this but jivram bhakt he was a brahmin and he not only follow each and every code and conducts describing the scriptures but also he followed bhagwan swami narayan's five vartmans <coughs> and by following this religious code and conduct he also praying and worshiping bhagwan swami narayan in this way he passes more time to devotion bhagwan swami narayan but not only in business he conduct business only to living a life not a prosperous life because he has no any kind of desire to enjoy worldly luxury or worldly any kind of pleasantness 
but he had one desire and that is to worship bhagwan swaminarayan and enjoy the real and divine bliss of bhagwan swaminarayan which is only in aksardham but he want to experience the same bliss while i live on this earth and that is why he he was praying bhagwan swaminarayan he was worshiping bhagwan swaminarayan and enjoy this bliss in this life once upon a time jivram bhakt as his business for his business he went many times to another countries and at the time we know there there was no any plane and that is why they had to go to another country only by ship there is no any other way and that is why jivram bhakt also went to another country for his business and at this time he went to sindh which is right now in pakistan and when jivram bhakt went there to sindh and uh, as for his business he purchased a huge amount of rice and he loaded all the packets of rice and in, into his ship and when he went back when he came back to his place vakaner in between at route uh, in en route uh in the ship he was worshiping and praying bhagwan swaminarayan he was engaged itself in devotion not on any kind of business because in the ship he was free he has no any at the time no mobiles no any other television no internet nothing and that is why he was free and that's why to not passing time but he got some benefit from it, this free time and that is the benefit is of worshiping bhagwan swaminarayan now he mm-hmm. was chanting bhagwan swaminarayan's name while contemplating on his divine form when he opened his eyes from very far he found uh, another ship the another coming near to it now after some time when the another ship coming near to his ship then he found out that not he two members and the captain of his ship they all three members and the captain they found out the the another ship which which is now near to their ship is of a terrorist ship now the terrorist challenge the jivram ship and he they they ordered to stop the ship and the captain and the crew members they understood that the situation is not not in our hand and that's why if we want to save our life we have to dive we have to took a dive into this ocean with a life jacket and that uh, this is only way to save our life by understanding the situation all the crew members and the captain of the ship when the tired ship they when they approach very near and when they throw the rope to another ship and join uh, and bind the ship bo- both the ship with a rope then the crew members and the captain of jivram ship they took a dive into ocean and they run away now jivram was a devotee and he was just chanting bhagwan's name while contemplating on bhagwan swaminarayan's divine form so he had no any sense of the terrorist attack and when terrorists enter into his ship then they found our goods loaded into the ship now they thought that if we if we have the ship and if we sold out these goods we will earn too much money but when they 
searching another thing than they found jivram he was chanting while closing his eyes and this those ch- terrorists the was bind both of jivram's hands be, uh, at his back side with a rope now then after the terrorists they attack they hit jivram's head with a iron weapon now it is just near impossible to recover this injury and uh, there is no any chance to live for jivram but the terrorists would the terrorists has no kind of any politeness any kind of compassion on any person and that is why they throw out jivram into this ocean now in the water you definitely know that without one's hands if your hands bound with a are tied with a rope and you are had to swim into the water in a pool you cannot swim because hands the most important thing to swim in the water and jivram's ha- both hands were tied on his back side so how can he even with legs he cannot swim in in ocean it is easy to swim into pool but it is very difficult to swim into ocean and jivram he had no any kind of sense what what had happening or what was what was happening or what he had what kind of pain on his head because there was great pain on his head and that is why he had no any kind of sense now jivram was in into water in ocean and his both hands were tied at behind and he could not know to swim only with the leg or on, only with the legs now definitely one can in in such a situation definitely any person can immediately <coughs> sink into the ocean but with the surprise of even jivram he could not sink into water he was thinking how is it possible i do not try to swim and still my body floating on this water how is it possible then he understood as i am chanting bhagwan swami narayan's name and contemplating on his divine form so bhagwan swami narayan is <coughs> protecting my life now he was also praying and remembering bhagwan swami narayan jivram has no kind of any kind of desire in his mind to even live long on this earth or he had no desire that bhagwan swami narayan himself appear there and protect him and he had even no tension he had no any attachment or desire to meet even his devotees nothing and that is why jivram bhakt was praying bhagwan swami narayan that oh my lord you are the most merciful god and that is why i have no desire to live long on this earth nor have i had desire for <coughs> meet at death but whatever your wishes please grant me at this time please <coughs> give me your darshan and bring me with you to your akshardham and at the time bhagwan swami narayan divinely appeared there with a lifeboat and he himself helped jivram to sat into the boat and he untied bhagwan himself untied jivram's hands and now bhagwan swami narayan politely touch on his uh, on jivram's head and that is why bhagwan's divine touch all of his pain is removed at the same time now jivram was sitting on live boat with bhagwan swami narayan bhagwan swami narayan <coughs> drive a boat to the destination 
or the destinated port. Now, at the port, Bhagwan himself feed food to Jivram and offer him some sweet water to drink. Now, after that, Jivram was walking towards his town, and <clears throat> he, uh, while walking, he remembering this incident, how Bhagwan Swami and himself divinely appear into ocean and how he helped him to save his life. On the other hand, the crew members and the captain of his ship, they reached to his town, Vankaner, and they, they sent the message to Jivram's mother that Jivram was caught by terrorists and he definitely, they definitely kill him. Now, by the, by this hearing this bad news of killing Jivram, all of his relatives gather in Jivram's house. All of making try to understand Jivram's mother that your son is now dead and that's why you just try to uh, perform his post uh, dead ceremonies and everything else. Now, Jivram's mother, he was also, uh, she was also a duty of Bhagwan Swaminarayan and she had a firm faith in Bhagwan Swaminarayan and that's why she said, no, my Lord Bhagwan Swaminarayan, he definitely protected my Jivram. But still the, relative, the relatives, they are not duty of Bhagwan Swaminarayan and that's why they told and they try to make understand, make understood Jivram's mother about the situation. When Jivram's mother he accept the relatives' understanding, and when she 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 also fell into deep grief for losing his own son, and that's that at the time he crying. He was just crying and at that time Bhagwan Swami and divinely appeared there in front of Jivram's mother and Bhagwan himself narrated the story of Jivram's, how he himself protected Jivram and saved his life. Now, and Bhagwan Swami told to uh, Jivram's mother that declare to your relatives that Jivram definitely will come tomorrow at noon. Now, by saying this, Bhagwan Swaminan disappeared from Jivram's house and uh, Jivram's mother, she had declared into public in, uh, in front of his relatives that <coughs> uh, Jivram has no kind of injury and he, he was safe and he definitely will come tomorrow at noon. The relatives was not a duty of Bhagwan Swaminan and that's why they have no trust in words of this uh, Jivram's mother. But still, they, uh, they were waiting for next noon. And at next day, at noon, Jivram, Jivram as Bhagwan Swami and his word, Jivram was uh, <coughs> coming to his town in Vakana and when he uh, come to his house, he found his relatives and his uh, all of his relatives. They were mourning for his death. Then they ask all. Of, uh, then he asked all of his uh, relatives, "Why are coming? Why are together my house and why are mourning for?" Then the relatives said, "The crew members and captain they s told us about the situation, about what had happened to your ship." And they say, uh, and that's why they, as they told us that you <coughs> meet a death, the terrorists kill you, and uh, that's why we are gathered here and we are mourning for your uh, for your death. Then Jivanam said, "No, my Bhagwan Swaminara is my Lord, and he he is a supreme Lord, and he is the most compassionate and merciful God, and that is why he had protected me." And in this way, Jivram Bhakti narrated all of his story, what had happened and how Bhagwan Swaminarayan protected him from this danger. By describing this Sadguru Niskunan Swami, 
write this incident in 136 chapter of Bhakta Chintamani. Now the another incident also described in this 136 chapter of the another devotees. We will describe, we will read it in next Sunday. Sri Ganeshyam Maharajani Jai अभूतव मुरति विनोद कारी पलपन विसरे नहीं जो विसारी जुगल चरण सोल चिन्न जेह नजर समी पे रहो अमारी एह नजर समी पे रहो अमारी एह Gansham Maharaj Nije, Hari Krishna Maharaj Nije, Swami Narayan Bhagwan Nije. Supreme Almighty, our beloved and utmost dear Gansham Maharaj, our beloved Pujipad Guruji, Pujya Santo, and all of you devotees, Jai Swami Narayan. The word supreme or supremacy is a very strong word in religion. It has much weight. Whenever one says the word supreme or mentions it in any particular way regarding a god, it very much has much weight. And due to that, there is numerous disputes all over the world. How so? Before I give you an example, let me give you a modern, up-to-date example. Suppose you lived in a neighborhood, and there was multiple houses, and the dads of each and every home, they had a hobby of specifying and collecting cars not model cars real cars meaning they had a, a hobby of cars now there were some dads who liked American muscle American muscle meaning American cars that went fast and there were some dads who had a favor for foreign cars now each and every week each and every dad would go to each person's garage and check out their car, how it was, took, took, take a look under the hood, what kind of engine it had, what kind of sil how many cylinders it had, and whatnot, and so forth and so on about the specs of a car. Now, each and every person would go to each and every garage and check, but they would think that my car is the best. Another person would think that his car is the best. It would go on and on. But there would be no end. Or there would be no question to the end where whose car is the best. 
Now, let me tell you something. It's not about if it's a foreign car or if it's about a car that's made in America. It's all about the performance of the car. In the same fashion, there are many, many religions with many, many gods. But why do devotees believe in Bhagwan Swaminarayan to be supreme over all? What was his performance that made him beyond everyone else? Why did he excel so much, so beyond any other avatar or any other deity or any other god in any fashion? What was it? Was it due to his six temples that he constructed that we talked about last week? Or was it due to writing the Shikshapatri, the book Code of Conducts, which no other god did, by the way? Or was it because he initiated 2,000 saints single-handedly? Or was it because he gave sermons that were of the Vedas, Purans, Upanishads, in the scripture called the Vachnamrut. Yes, it was due to all of these points that I mentioned above. But beyond all other points, his supremacy, it all lied in when he took the form of Nilkant Verni from the age of 11 to the age of 18. These are all factors that I told you that are great, but to put the period at the end, or you can say to put the cherry on top, Bhagwan Swaminarayan traveled seven years, one month, and 11 days from the age of 11 to 18. He covered four countries, Nepal, China, Tibet, and India. 12 states in India and traveled barefoot over 12,000 kilometers and visited 187 places. Just think, when you were 11 years old, would you have even had this thought? Not only that, furthermore, suppose you had a thought of traveling, would it be like this? independently, without your parents, without any kind of life support? Bhagwan Swaminarayan, as when he was Nilkan Verni, carried only five particular things with him while on this travel, while on this journey. Those five things, well, first and foremost, he just wore a small cloth to cover his private parts. Also, he had a small book called the Gutko. Also, he had a mara. He had a pot which carried water, water like a vessel. And he had a, <clears throat> a, a, a pretty much a sitting straw mat where he would sit. He carried these things, but he traveled for seven years without any kind of shoe wear footwear all around India in the Himalayas and so on and so forth no other god in the past or no other avatar or deity has done this feat whatsoever in his seven year trip he changed mankind's perspective meaning before people had seen Oh, this God has done this kind of penance, and this God has done this kind of penance. But after Nilkan Verney's adventures embark throughout India, mankind's perspective, meaning mankind's vision towards him, completely changed. Well, how so? Let's take a look. This lecture is called Nilkan Verney's Kalyan Yatra. And through his whole travel throughout India, he liberated numerous souls. That's why it's called 
Kalyan Yatra. What we're going to do is we're going to break down his whole yatra, meaning his whole pilgrimage, his whole travel, by four categories. Number one, fearlessness. Number two, penance. Number three, renounce. And number four, liberation. These four categories, he particularly showed throughout his travel in the seven years. This week, for this lecture, we're going to talk about the first two, which is fearlessness and penance. And next week, we'll continue on the other two. But regarding these four categories, number one, fearlessness. Now, Sri Jimaraj himself says in the Vachnamrut, this is after he became Sajan Swami, when he was giving his sermons. In the chapter, Gadada, middle chapter, 55th Vachnamrut, he says that, in fact, I'd like to stay only in the forest, but I was not at least a bit afraid. Even when I came across large snakes, lions, elephants, and countless other types of animals in the forest, there was not even the slightest fear of dying in my heart. In this way, I always remained, remained fearless in the dense forest. Sriji Maharaj, when he was narrating this Vachnamrut, talked about his past, meaning when he was in the form of Milkan Verni. And he talked about how no matter how much of an adverse circumstance he approached, or no matter how many fearful animals he approached, like lions, snakes, elephants, he was never afraid. I'm reminded of a story when Nilkan Verni was traveling in the village of Sripur. Maharaj, Nilkan Verni was traveling there and he approached this village, Sripur, and he arrived there and on the outskirts of the, the whole village, there was a, a mutt, or you can say a small, a small, you can say temple that was there. And there, a head saint and his other various dis disciples lived there. Now, Nukun Verni traveled in, <clears throat> and he took a seat underneath a banyan tree there. The monk, the head of the whole monastery, saw this, and he went and came out and approached Nukun Verni. And he said, Nukun Verni, please, <clears throat> why don't you come into my monastery, or why don't you go and live in the village? Nukun Verni asked, why? I love the nature. I love outside environment more than anything else. Then the Mahant, he started to explain that every night after midnight, a man-eating lion comes and whoever is outside or whoever's cattle or animal is left outside, it would devour and eat. So we are always afraid and every night we close our doors and we lock everything up, our windows and so does the town or so does the village. Everyone is afraid of this lion. It comes every single night and we are fearful of it. Milk and Verney said, you're fearful of it, but let's see what happens tonight. I want to rest here underneath this banyan tree. I will not stay in your monastery. The man himself was astonished. How could such a young boy at this small age even say some kind of statement like this? Something which is beyond ordinary. Something which is displays some other personality which is not in ordinary humans. But the Mahant and his disciples went back inside, respected Nilkan Verni's <clears throat> decision to stay outside. And through the window of the monastery, the Mahant and the priest displayed and watched Nilkan Verni. It was 10 p.m., and then 11 p.m., and then 12 p.m. Now every day the lion would come after 12 p.m. So at its usual time, the lion came. It roared and came slowly. The, mon the priest was afraid, of course, 
seeing that Nilkan Verney was there alone in the dark, in the cold, the moonlight above penetrated the whole sky like a spotlight was upon Nilkan Verney, like it was supposed to display the show right in front of him. Nilkan Verney stayed poised in his meditation. The lion approached Nilkan Verney, and when it approached, Nilkan Verney opened his eyes. There he saw the lion. The Mahant became so afraid, he was about to shout, Please run, please run. But Nilkan Verney's fearness, fearlessness was displayed here. Nilkan Verney raised his hand, and it seemed like he was calling the lion forward. The Mahant was astonished. He just couldn't believe his eyes. And there, Nilkan Verney put his hand on the lion's head and just like a pet animal just like how Nilkan Verney had knew this lion for ages and ages the lion sat at the feet of Nilkan Verney and rested and became Nilkan Verney's pillow for the night the Mahant was astonished beyond belief all the saints were astonished beyond belief, but it happened right in front of them. So they knew that this was no ordinary person. This had to have been God. Because for years and years on, they're witnessing the lion devouring and killing animals and humans. And this time, this lion approached and was tamed so easily by Nilkan Verney proving that Nilkan Verney's supremacy had great strength. After some time, the lion got back up and left the scene. And then the month and all his disciples came out that night and prostrated and bowed before Nilkan Verney. And the Mahant said that this is yours, this whole monastery. All my disciples are yours. You can do whatever you want. Everything is yours. But Nilkan Verney said, I have or I am on a greater task than you think I am. So you can keep your belongings, but this lion will never come back again. And from that day forth, that lion never came back to that village ever again. But just think about it, an 11 year old boy showing such kind of fearlessness that no other man can ever possess, even if he tried. And such a man-eating lion, not a lion that was tamed, but a wild lion. Just like that lion, Nilkan Verney approached snakes, jaguars, cheetahs, elephants, through the Indian jungles and was never daunted or was never shaken by any of these animals proving that his fearlessness was supreme beyond all other gods or avatars. Not only that, I talked about his penance. That's our second category. Now. <clears throat> When we talk about penance, or you can say austerities, the type of austerities that Nilkan Verney performed were beyond capacity for any human being, you can say. But if I keep explaining, it would make no sense or validate my point. I think only if I tell you Charitras regarding Nilkan Verney's austerities, his thup, then you would only find out how great he truly is. Well, Nilkan Verney, as I mentioned to you, traveled in four countries, India, Nepal, China, and Tibet. There's the Himalayan mountain ranges that are above in North India, covers Tibet 
and Nepal, that whole region, and some of China. Barefooted, Milkan Verney traveled to the Himalayas and he came to a place called Muktinath, which they call Pulhasram, at the altitude of 12,500 feet. Now, <clears throat> I was just doing a, a little bit of research and I found out that obviously everyone knows that Mount Everest is the highest mountain in the world, which ranges 29,000 feet. Now, when you reach a certain altitude, you start to develop a lack of oxygen and your blood pressure drops and whatever. There's many symptoms. There's a certain dead zone, it's called. When you climb a certain point, when you're climbing Everest, you sound climb, I think it's 25,000 feet and up and beyond. It's called dead zone, meaning that you cannot survive in those conditions. No humans can. They have gear now in modern technology. They don't wear, they don't go footless. They have special shoes. They have special pants, coat, headgear, oxygen tanks, everything. And yet they can barely make it up. Now, just think, with this modern age, only a few hundred people have climbed the Himalayan ranges or the Himalaya itself, Mount Everest. But Nilgan Verney, going barefoot without any kind of clothing, but only the clothing below his waist, up to his knees, and with no other kind of modern equipment like oxygen or a coat or a jacket he traveled to these rigid areas where the temperatures dropped from 30 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit not only that but when Milken Verney reached Muktinath he did austerities on one foot you know in puja every morning we do <clears throat> what is called Tapni Mara. Now this Tapni Mara, if you didn't know, is dedicated to Nilkan Verney when he did this Tapni Mara for two and a half months straight on one foot. It's a sign, it's a dedication for him. It's kind of like a remembrance that he did this kind of austerities for us. But we will perform one Tapni Mara in our AC or heating conditions, whatever is needed. But going on, his daily routine for this Tapni Mara would be he would go early in the morning to this certain area and go throughout the whole day and up to nighttime. He would perform and stay in one exact posture and perform this severe penance with no food no water, just air. And you want to know one thing? While he was doing the Mara, he wouldn't be doing it for himself, or he wasn't doing it for himself, but he was doing it for his devotees to come. He was doing it for the devotees of the future. So if you think about it, we're kind of enjoying the luxuries of all his penance. Here we are using modern technology to listen to preachings. Here we are living and staying in such kind of facilities which provide AC when needed, heating when needed. Here we are staying in this such a country which provides health benefits to those who have low income or whatnot. Here we are staying in a temple where devotees bring us food, water, clothing, pay for each and every bill. But we have to remember that this is all due to the penance of Milken Verney, which he performed in these seven years, especially the penance that he performed in Muktinath. So that's why we should dedicate and we should remember Nilkan Verney every time we do Tapni Mara 
in the morning because of his severe penance that he performed for us. Moreover, he also went to Mansarvar. Now this is a lake. It's a freshwater lake and it's the only freshwater lake in the world uh, which is of the highest altitude which is uh, 12,000 no, sorry, which is 14,000 feet. Now there, our Puja Guruji went twice at this lake and also took a bath in the lake. Not only that, but explained the whole maima, the whole greatness of this lake, that the Supreme Lord Himself has bathed in this lake. But moreover, going back to Nilkan Verney's epic adventure at this lake, now, there's frequent snowstorms there and gusty winds triggered deadly avalanches. Yet, Nukun Verney at the age of 12 went there and did such kind of austerities in temperatures, which I mentioned below, were 30, negative 30 to 40 below freezing. Now, you're probably asking, how did he survive such kind of conditions? It all remains a secret, but we can definitely say that Nilkan Verney was no ordinary person, but he was God himself. And we believe so as of right now, and even in the future, when these facts will be revealed to new devotees and new members, they would be astonished to see that no other human can possibly ever do this kind of feat. And no other avatar in the past has ever done this, which Nilkan Verney or Bhagwan Swami Narayan has done for us, you can say. That's the main thing, to remember that he has done it for us. When he was in this lake, there were swans that were called Huns. Now, a special thing about this lake was that he made, well, let me tell you, there were swans. And these swans, when you mix milk and water together, these swans are able to extract just the milk part and leave the water part out. So it was some kind of special technique these swans had. But Maharaj himself, he took a spiritual vow there that he would make or initiate 500 Paramahansa, meaning those who would be able to distinguish wisdom and spirituality over worldly and materialistic pleasures. And Maharaj, when he became Sajan Swami, did make 500 elite Paramahansas, which were called Nan Santo. And these Nan Santos completely revolutionized and completely changed the perspective of devotees through their scriptures, through their preachings, and through their knowledge, proving again that Bhagwan Swami Narayan is supreme overall. So these are the two categories that I wanted to cover with you today. One was fearlessness, and the second one was penance, which Nilkan Verney performed through his epic journey around India for seven years and 11 months, and through all this, we have to remember that he did it all for us. So next week, we'll cover the other two categories and conclude the supremacy of Nilkan Verney. Gansham Maharaj Nije Shri Patim Shri Dharam Sarvadevishwaram Bhakti Dharmatmajam Vasudevam Hare Madhavam Kesavam Kamadam Karanam Swami Narayanam Nilkantham Bhaje Gansham Maharaj Nije Jai